Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here and um, and welcome all the distinguished uh, academicians and speakers here in the in the conference. It has been now, we can say, a series of of uh, wonderful and academically fruitful events and. Uh, these two days we are also having a quite um, interesting and topical uh, issue about the state and uh, and issues concerning concerning the the nation state and and its uh, transformation um, my topic is um, uh, is concentrated on on sovereignty uh, and I'm uh, I'm questioning um, the classical uh, concept uh, of sovereignty, which which you know is called uh, uh, Westphalian uh, sovereignty. Um, I think, uh, firstly, in order to understand sovereignty in today's we can say globalized or, or globalizing world. Um, its uh, transformation should be treated in a slightly wider uh, social uh, pragmatic context. On the one hand, uh, the 20th century has been a century of um, prevalence of sovereignty, while, however, on the other hand, it has been a century of reformulation of a traditional modernist sovereignty. Uh, we can say that today almost the entire world is covered by state, uh, states that are sovereign. Uh, compared, uh, for example, with the beginning of, of the 20th century, where a large part of the world was colonized and sovereignty was a privilege reserved to, uh, to so-called civilized few. So according to this, it's, it's quite a significant step ahead. Uh, decolonization considerably changed that role. Uh, in the period of 1945 till 1989, more than a hundred new sovereign stage, uh, states emerged in the world. Uh, and in addition, another approximately 20 sovereign states emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1990. Uh, the idea of uh, self-determination and uh, the famous 14 points of President Wilson, as well as the idea that the nation has, a, has to live in its own country, had, uh, has led us to a different results today. Uh, speaking about sovereignty, of course, uh, an in uh, inevitable question arises on whether in today's globalizing world absolute sovereignty is even possible or has there really ever been absolute sovereignty. As we know, uh, the absolute nature of sovereignty means that the state is free from uh, restrictions, unrestrained or unlimited by a constitution. As a sovereign unit, it exercises it exercises supreme lawmaking and law forcing authority within delineated territory and uh, constituted the supreme object of, of political allegiance. In the external domain too, it was recognized as uh, inviolable and authoritative by other discrete, equal in status and independent states. Uh, probably. Thomas Hobbes had a similar kind of dream about the sovereign state when uh, he described it as the most powerful monster called Leviathan, which has uh, kind of unlimited power. And for Hobbes, there was no way in which legal limits or sovereign power could be imposed without undermining the ability of the state to maintain order. This means that uh, sovereignty is not restricted by a constitution, by the laws of its uh, predecessors, or by the custom, and no areas of law or behavior are reserved as being outside of its control. 
but in reality, um, it's probably very tough to think that any, even the most great empires, have had absolute authority without any external circumstances to enforce laws, to make their strategic development plans, to build up their military force, and so on. Um, another great uh, theorist, such as uh, Bodan, has said that if we insist, however, that absolute power means exemptions from all law whatsoever, there is no prince in a world who can be regarded as sovereign, since all the princes of the earth are subject of the laws of God and of nature, and even the certain human laws are common to all nations. Uh, also, an interesting fact about sovereignty, what argues against its uh, absoluteness is its necessity for recognition, or in other words, the act of recognition is necessary in order for states to function as sovereign entities. Uh, the claim of sovereign state to exercise final authority within uh, its own boundaries depends logically on the ex uh, extension of this same right to all states, and states therefore constitute each other as sovereign. But the idea that one actor can constitute another as sovereign is at its root contradictionary. This need for recognition clearly indicates that uh, purportedly sovereign states are actually actors embedded in a matrix of structured social processes. In fact, um, the Westphalian sovereignty slowly started to lose its empirical ground and is not only related to the countries of the so-called third world. Um, and for instance, Professor Millerson has said that uh, it's sometimes very difficult to say where and when with regards to sovereignty is the horse and where is the cart. Even, if the, if, even in the case of internally relatively stable and highly developed countries, the legal concept of sovereignty plays an important part in the existence of these states as states. Large, uh, mainly ethnic, and religious conflicts of recent times have also seriously raised the question of whether solving these conflicts is a domestic matter or of each state or a matter of international society and law. Um, the legal practical solution of such conflicts uh, have raised great doubts of uh, Westphalian sovereignty. The questions on the connections between legal and ethical moral arguments in solving such cases have also emerged powerfully. Um, and of course, modern media has also played an important role in making these matters topical with its ability to mediate images of someone's atrocities or sufferings in the places the viewers often do not know about or live very far from and the media can bring these uh, cases to millions and millions of, of people. So a conflict that used to be a domestic matter may quickly acquire a global and international meaning. So uh, viewing sovereignty in today's world, it seems a little ironic that it is Europe from which uh, Westphalian sovereignty began that is currently so intensively developing the model of supranational organizations that has reduced the share of states in today's international society in several ways. Uh, undoubtedly, the European Union uh, as a so-called supranational organizational model has several advantages to the model of the federal state. It mainly depends on the aspect of national sovereignty. In solving these issues, uh, European Union as a supranational organization should first and foremost be developed as a transnational network, or at least seen as a transnational network. The 
transnational state model as a network without a central point would also correspond better to the pluralist concept of shared sovereignty in the globalizing world. Based on the European Union as a kind of a postmodern state model with the concept of shared sovereignty, we could ask, would a member state infringe its sovereignty by transferring some of its powers of decision to the European Union? Uh, one example of transfer of partial external sovereignty could be signing of some international agreements. By that, a state authorizes some international organizations to make a certain part of its potentially binding international decisions. Um, in the given cases, a state gives up a part of its right of discretion, enabling others to make decisions that the state was initially able to make by itself. Nevertheless, it is uh, here with presumed that the state has acted voluntarily when delegating its sovereignty. It means that the state can take back its uh, authorizations at any time though the actual power of decisions or competences and the competences of authorities are two different aspects of sovereignty. And it seems that the right of authorization and the right of taking it back are a lot more important than it, in each, uh, it initially seems. Since a state has these authorities, it can be treated as completely independent, even when the state has delegated all of its rights of discretion to other organs. At that, it is naturally presumed that the authorizations have been given voluntarily and that the member state uh, has the right to take them back at any time. It means that the authorization are without the term and can be cancelled under certain terms and conditions. For example, when they start hindering the development of national sovereignty. Treating sovereignty as a resource and competence that can be manipulated, it has acquired a new substance and operationally compared to the classical concept of sovereignty. Um, international legal documents uh, signed under the cover of the European Union mainly define sovereignty in the negative manner stating what the sovereign state may not do, what sovereignty is not. For example, states must acknowledge other states as equals, may not endanger their territorial integrity, use force in case of conflicts, and so on. The only, or one of the positive definitions of sovereignty can be used in its situation is that the states acting independently on the international arena are sovereign. According to Krasner, sovereignty has never been taken for granted. In violation of first one sovereignty, the foreign policies of major powers and sometimes lesser ones as well have sometimes been designed to change the domestic political structure of other states. Anxious about its own security, the Soviet Union imposed Eastern communist regimes on its European satellites after the Second World War. International legal sovereignty refers to mutual recognition of states and their legal equality. The state can join international organizations, enter into internationally binding agreements with other sovereign states. This is a version of minimalist definition of, of external sovereignty. Most uh, jurists, however, still base their handling of internal sovereignty on Kelsen's concept of, of basic norm. It means that in establishing sovereignty, unity of the state and the law must be taken as the basis. In the analysis of legal systems, Kelsen introduced the concept of Grund norm. Legal fundamentalists find that from a legal theoretical point of view, a state cannot be defined differently from a closed legal system. All other definitions are too vague and take us from legal theory to general theory of states that was popular in Germany in the 19th century. According to Kelsen, 
domestic law of each state and international law form one system of norms. The, prim uh, the primacy of international law makes state sovereignty possible in a legal sense as every sovereign state is recognized as sovereign by the grand norm of international law. International cooperation is based on voluntary relations between sovereign states. The potential rights and obligations under the cooperation with binding nature can occur only with the, with the consent of the participants. As I know, the nation-state model of the 19th century was based on the understanding that uh, the one whose decision must be adhered at, uh, to, and, to and cannot be appealed in sovereign, is sovereign. Nowadays, it is emphasized that the right of discretion does not necessarily mean we have to be the ones to make the decisions ourselves. The state, as any other legal person, can delegate its power of decision to some other entity. For instance, let us assume that the state that authorizes third party to handle provisions of, of higher education. By that, the state gives part of its internal sovereignty that is related to provisions of education to a legal person governed by a private law. The state authorizes the third party to carry out certain state functions as a supreme authority. From a formal aspect, shared sovereignty can be talked about as long as, uh, as the possi uh, possibility of cancelling the given aut uh, authorizations is a complete as if the state performed its own competence. A significant shift in sovereignty can be discussed only when the binding final decision that affects the state has been made in a way that the state has not voluntarily entered into the relationship which, uh, which that decision proceeded from. Um, accepting the former legal approach to sovereignty, however, it must be emphasized that today's world has become highly utilitarian and even instrumental. It means that in um, today's world, state sovereignty is deeply related to the, uh, to the macroeconomic policy of the state. It is thought that this prerogative of sovereignty will continue to characterize state sovereignty for many years to come. Here with the competences that are now, uh, are now considered more important than uh, sovereignty from the aspect of state independence and development are also often emphasized. For example, basic education, health, development of small-scale enterprises, political stability, protection of private property, innovative investments, modernizing of management, and so on. Another matter is that uh, in the different context of development of society, the share of, uh, of the uh, mentioned competences may increase and decrease from time to time. Uh, it means that in entering of terminating some kind of international agreement today, the parties are increasingly basing their perspective of different economic and innovation boosting competences as opposed to to uh, visionary or moral considerations. The world has become more pragmatic uh, and uh, definitely has, uh, that has also the effect to the, uh, to the sovereignty, sovereignty as well. Um, the sovereignty is a competence of making final and binding decisions in some matters and the right to delegate that authorization to other legal persons at the same time preserving the right to take it back. Uh, so sovereignty cannot exist only as a right of delegation. We could not speak of a sovereign state if it wouldn't ex execute most of its power of decision. Even when sovereignty has not been officially infringed, certain security risks in withdrawal of rights as well as foreign and domestic policy risks are often significant enough to prevent uh, the states from taking such steps. When uh, viewing the European Union from, the, uh, from these aspects, uh, it, it probably must be agreed with those who find the European Union integration is largely uh, um, a kind of irre irreversible process. 
Um, Irres uh, irreversibility means, first of uh, all, ruling out the possibility of an end of European Union by terminating all founding treaties and those, uh, the entire collapse of the experiment, but also radical demonization of powers of the organs of the Union. Therefore, it should be discussed truly once, uh, one more time to reach consensus over the conceptual and legal basis of the European Union that would, on the one hand, take into consideration sovereignty of its member states and, on the other, the new economic, technological and political legal realities of the globalizing and, and postmodernizing society. So, uh, from this uh, developing or, or to say postmodern society and state, the modern international system can be handled as a network. The peculiarity of a network organization is that the network is not a, a hierarchical but a flat structure without the center. Each uh, state can be compared to one of its knots. The strength of the network depends not only on the strength of the knot, but first and foremost on the sturdiness of the connections between the, uh, between the knots. These connections can be figuratively compared to the rights and obligations between states. Naturally, the connections and relations between some of the knots may be more permanent, strong and resistant than others. It may depend on a lot of different circumstances. For, uh, for, uh, for example, the location of knots in, its, uh, in the network, the material of the knitting, uh, the technique, and, and so on. For an actual state, this material is first and foremost the economic te technological capacity of the state. There is no doubt that uh, those states that are more developed economically as well as for their military technological defense capability, are also more sovereign in de facto sense. Regardless of uh, the differences in the knots and their connections, the network that is today's international society or the European Union can be vital mainly thanks to the vitality of the network as a uniform organization. That is uh, its security system in today's globalizing world. However, this is where the problems start. The network mobile, uh, model that may at times even seem perfect on a theoretical level to the European Union and its member states may, however, cause several serious problems on an actual and practical level. On the one hand, it is rational to subject your rules of conduct to some kind of general requirements. On the other hand, however, it is likely that the member states will actively defend the basic values of their constitution and the main order by using the uh, respective legal measures. Consequ uh, consequently, the issue largely boils down to selection of, uh, of the control model uh, also in case of network or organization. In other words, it is a question of what kind of European Union would like to live in or what is the European Union we imagine. Therefore, uh, in trying to decide what should be the relationship between the legal order, for instance, for example, of Estonia and the European Union, it would be rational to ask first what kind of European Union we would like to see as a pole. Could uh, an action that is rational and maybe vital to all member states taken separately also vital to the European Union as a foal? What might happen if a decision would be made in favor of a network organization that allows for the EU law to be subordinated to constitutional review of a member state? Would the situation not become chaotic in that case? The Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, for example, stated in a decision concerning the Lisbon Treaty that uh, democratic states based on the rule of law can impact on the modern uh, trans, uh, transnational, uh, transnational network society only when both public and private interests are followed in international communication. The entire system would fall apart if the member state would be allowed to ignore the union, uh, union measures at their own discretion. 
Um, the fact that uh, measures would be declared non-implementable uh, in court would uh, basically change nothing. The prerequisite, the prerequisite for a political decision would no longer be fulfilled. Wherefore, the decision process should be started at the European Union level from the beginning. A member states' courts would, uh, courts would probably declare a union legislation non implementable only if it's contrary to the fundamental rights of the basic principles of the state's constitution. Nevertheless, uh, that is also uh, pretty much the matter of, of uh, interpretation. Um, though sovereignty is not an uh, outdated concept, I think we can, we can conclude, uh, and, and that it, it should be set aside. Only handling of sovereignty as, an, as a universal and absolute concept is, is outdated. Sovereignty changes every time that states have to face new problems and possibilities either on their own or together. Follow the new interests, develop new norms and learn from the experience of the, of the past. Transformation of sovereignty reflects clearly the new way of understanding of the old and new norms. Being based uh, on the new framework of international law and politics, in the last half century evolution of the socio-political basis of this framework has been mostly related to the globalizing and fragmenting world. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.